Thank you, brother. Good to have Dwayne Sexton with us this morning. Been sick as a dog. I'm glad he made it today. And folks, remember Brenda Presley? You know, she fell and broke her hip. She suffered greatly for about a day or so until they did the surgery. Then when they did the surgery, she immediately started feeling better. And I told her that, I said, when they do this surgery, you won't be hurting like you are right now because that's what happened to my wife. She hurt for a long time until they did the surgery. So please remember Brenda. She told me, well, she told me that they're going to let her out Monday unless something happens. She did, but she had an encounter with God when that happened. It, yeah, I'm going to let her tell it too. That's right, exactly. But she, uh, God let her go through that so he could show up, and uh, he did. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 1 with me this morning, please. Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew 1, verse 1. The scripture says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Father, thank you for this holy word now, and I pray that you'd bless it this morning to the hearing of the people, those who hear it now, those who will hear it later. I ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, you can be seated. On the fly leaf immediately preceding this uh, first page of the New Testament, my Bible says, the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the authorized King James Version. And then immediately what follows is the gospel according to Matthew chapter number one. And I don't know that I've ever seen an order of the New Testament books that's any different than what we have in our hands right now. I'm sure that that was the first book of the New Testament that you turn to. But most folks don't realize that the New Testament is defined for you in Hebrews chapter number nine. For there in Hebrews chapter number 9, it says, Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. So therefore, the New Testament started when our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, there gave himself so that you and I could be saved. It is no coincidence that we have four Gospels. We have Matthew, we have Mark, we have Luke, and we have John. They are definitely different. Three of these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have been called synoptic gospels. You can take that or leave it. And the fourth gospel is the gospel of John, which is altogether different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The four gospels represent or are represented by the four cherubim that stand before the throne of Almighty God. Each one of these cherubim have the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, and the face of an eagle. Each one of these creatures represents something profound as it relates to God. Each one of these gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have their direct, cor they cor uh, correspond directly with the face of a man or the face of an ox or the face of a lion or the face of an eagle. The lion is the king of the beast. So Matthew chapter number one is the generations of the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of, David, or as the king of Israel, the son of David. The second gospel is the gospel of Mark that corresponds with the face of the ox of one of these cherubim, and the ox is a burden, is a beast of burden. It is a servant animal. It's the kind of animal that works for mankind. And therefore, the gospel of Mark is altogether different from Matthew and Luke in that it begins immediately with the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we've got the gospel of Luke. The gospel of Luke corresponds to the face of the man of the cherubim because Luke is the, is the book about the man. It is the only book in the Bible that traces the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ all the way back 
to God Almighty and calls him the Son of God in the sense that he traces that genealogy back. So the book of Luke has definitely corresponds with the face of a man. And then we have the last gospel, the gospel of John. The gospel of John is not a synoptic gospel. The gospel of John is the last gospel to be written in the New Testament canon. We're not sure when it was written, sometime after 90 AD by the apostle John. But the gospel of John does not start in time. The gospel of John starts in eternity. It does not give the genealogy of Christ as it relates to a human being, it gives Christ as it relates to God Almighty. It lifts our eyes above the earthly realm and lift and causes us to look into eternity. The Gospel of John forces us to deal with everlasting to everlasting. For it starts like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse number 13 of John 1 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Apostle John makes it very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty. So we have four cherubim. These four cherubim are before the throne of God, but there was a fifth one. That fifth cherub is Satan. Uh, most folks erroneously refer to Satan as a fallen angel. He's not an angel. He never has been an angel. There is a difference between an angel and a cherubim. If you want to use the term angel in a generic sense, like it's an angelic being, that's okay to use it in reference to Satan. But Satan, folks, is a cherubim. In Ezekiel chapter number 28, he said, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I think it's quite remarkable to know, if we go back and trace the history of creation, that Satan no doubt was there with the other four cherubim. He was there as he led the celestial choir in worship and praise to God. And he was there looking upon the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. How much Satan knew of him, I do not know. Satan is a creature just like you. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He doesn't have the characteristics of Godhood. There's only one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one God manifesting himself as a man, and that's the Lord Jesus as he walked among us 2,000 years ago. But Satan is an exalted creature. He said, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I think it's quite remarkable that we've got four Gospels. I've often wondered, what would Satan write? Had he not fallen, would he have written the fifth Gospel? There's something about the Lord Jesus Christ that speaks to Satan like nothing else does. Because he knew him before he was incarnate, then he knew him when he was incarnate. When he came to him in the wilderness, after 40 days of, being, of, 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 of literally giving himself over to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, fasting and prayer, Satan came to him and said, if thou be the son of God, if you are the chosen one, if you're the holy one of God, if you are, then you can turn these stones into bread. If you are, then you can do this and you can do that. Now, whether Satan knew exactly who the Lord Jesus Christ was at that time, God incarnate in flesh, I don't know. I've often wondered, did he really know that he was the son of God or was he trying to determine this one that he was dealing with as to exactly who he was? That God would manifest himself in flesh one day? There's no doubt in Satan's mind. Satan knows the Bible better than any Bible scholar that's ever walked on the face of this earth. He can quote scripture by friend. He can quote it forward and backward. Satan can quote the Bible like you wouldn't believe. Don't ever try to outsmart him. Don't ever try to outwit him. Don't ever think that you're smarter than Satan. He knows the book. When he quoted the Bible to the Lord Jesus Christ, there in the book of Matthew chapter number four, he quoted it in verbatim and knew exactly what he was saying. But the Lord Jesus Christ quoted scripture back to him because you see, even though Satan Satan knows the Bible. The Lord Jesus wrote the Bible. And there's the difference between the two of them. The Lord Jesus Christ is the author of the scripture. So what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a picture that the Holy Spirit wants you to have of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many men, good men, well-meaning men have sat down to write a history or a, or a chronology of the life of Christ. I've got some of them and they're written by good men and I'm not here this morning to disparage them in any sense whatsoever. But I do not believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is written so that you might have a chronological account day by day, moment by moment of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is written from the perspective that the Holy Spirit wants you to have of his kingship 
of his servantship, of, his ser of the fact that he is the man, Christ Jesus, and that exalted eagle that sails into the heavens when God shows you from everlasting to everlasting who the Son of God is. I believe these four Gospels are written, therefore, to give you a divine perspective on who the Son of God is so that you can know that and receive that from the Holy Spirit of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John therefore laid the foundation for the New Testament. I want you to notice carefully, it is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is about the Son of God. The Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. To the two on the road to Emmaus, he said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. That's a separate study in itself, but it's a wonderful study to find Christ in every book of the Bible. You can find him in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You can find him all through the scripture. He's everywhere in the Bible because it is about him. And the reason it is about him is because he is absolutely the most important thing there is, past, present, and future. You can become a Bible scholar, historian. Everything that men could ever learn can be accumulated in your knowledge. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are ignorant of the one that can save your soul. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John therefore tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John presents him in a special way as I've said before. In the Gospel of John it gives you the great I am's. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the living word. I am that I am that I am. To the Jews he said before Abraham was I am. We go back to the book of Exodus when the Lord God revealed himself to Moses and began to reveal his name to him. In the Old Testament God took a man and when he'd take a man, he began to reveal to that man something about his character. And my friend, I hold Moses in high esteem. Believe me, when we come to the New Testament, there are many that say, well, Moses said this and Christ said that. Oh, no, 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 no. You got it all messed up. The Pharisees said this and Christ said that, not Moses. There is nowhere the Lord Jesus Christ ever countered what Moses had to say. The Pharisees said, we be sons of Moses. We be children of Abraham, so forth and so on. And the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, if you had been, you would have believed in me for Moses spoke of me and he certainly did. No, no, no. There is no conflict between that Old Testament and the New Testament. The conflict is in the mind of that one that perverts the scripture. But the Old Testament prophets began to look forward to the coming of Christ. And God revealed himself many times by his name. I repeat, I preached a message to you the other day about the Jehovistic combinations in the Bible. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Salom, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Rapha. These are Jehovistic combinations are simply saying, I am Jehovah. I am the covenant keeping God. This is what I am to you. You accept me for who I am. I bind myself in this relationship with you. Back there in the book of Genesis to Abraham in Genesis 17. He said, Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect for I am El Shaddai. I am almighty God. And my friend, it's the idea of who he is that makes us who we are. There's a lot in his name. There in the book of Exodus, he said to Abraham, when they said, Abraham said to Moses, Moses said to the Lord, what am I going to say to these people? Who are the, when they asked me, who sent me? When they, when they, when they asked me, who is it? Who's your God? Who sent you to me to come to lead us in bond, out of bondage? And the Lord God said, you tell them that I am hath sent you. And what do you mean I am? I am what? That is what it's about. I am. He said, I am the everlasting one. I am life. I am true existence. I am the future. I am your home. I am your life. I am everything there is. So the idea, my friend, from Scripture is not so much what God does for you. It's what God is to you. You begin to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is not so much your Savior because he did this for you. Your Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior because that's what he is to you. It is that little nuance right there, that little little crossing there that when you begin to look at it, you begin to understand what I'm talking about today. I'm not asking the Lord Jesus Christ to save me from anything. I'm taking the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I call upon him because there's nowhere else to turn. I call upon him because I receive him into my soul and into my spirit. I don't want the Lord Jesus Christ to be my helper. I want the Lord Jesus Christ to be 
my life. I want to move and live and have my being in him. In plainer words, everything that I am or ever hope to be is tied up in who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. The gospel of John is written that you might believe. It makes it clear this is why I wrote this, John said. He said, if I wrote all the books that I could write about the Lord Jesus Christ, he said the world could not hold it. So I wonder about that. I wonder if the only books in this world would be the books of science, true science, and then the rest of it would be talking about Jesus. I don't think that'd be too bad to you. I don't think that'd be bad at all if every book you picked up talked about the Lord Jesus in one aspect or another, in one, in, 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 you know, one perspective or another. Now, if I took all of you in this house this morning and inquired of you each one individually, and I ask you individually as a person, how, what is it about the Lord Jesus Christ? that makes him so personal to you as your savior. I mean, after all, he is your savior. You'd say, well, preacher, I used to be this, I used to be that, and he saved me from my sins. That's all good, but who's saving you right now? Who's gonna save you tomorrow? Who's gonna save you the next day? Who's gonna be your savior when you stand before God? When you stand to be judged, there's only one savior. There's just one name. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Some folks don't like that. They get very uncomfortable when you, begin, when you get personal with them about their salvation. They say, well, that's a private affair. It won't be private when God calls you home. It won't be private when you stand before him to be judged. You won't be private when he looks at you and say, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. I never knew you. I want you to get your understanding of Christ out of your head. I want to get it into your heart. I want to get into that part of you that makes you what you are. Now, I wish you could have been there that day when I was standing there holding the hand of Sister Presley, and she told me what she had experienced with God. I'm not going to jump the gun. I'm going to let her tell you, but I'm going to tell you right now, it was quite a thing. Believe me, it was quite a thing. Now, she'll never, that'll never be taken away from her. That's hers from now on. Until she leaves this world, that was an encounter she had with God. It is these encounters that you have with God that makes you what you are. And I want to tell you right now, glory to God, there's nothing on this earth that can be more important than a real encounter with God. So many folks, they folks, they have a hypothetical religion. They have an intellectual faith. They assent to certain things in the Bible. They've been confirmed and baptized, but they've never had an encounter with God. When a sinner has an encounter with God, they never are the same again. There's something that changes them. I've tried my best to get it across to people. He can't be as big as he is. He can't be as great as he is. He can't be the almighty and touch you and you be the same from then on. There's something about a God like that that's going to change you for the rest of your life. Amen. That's what we need. That's what we hunger for. That's what we thirst for. This is what John's talking about when he writes down these I am sayings of Christ. He doesn't write down and say, I'm going to feed the hungry. The Lord Jesus Christ does not say, I am food to the hungry. He said, I'm the bread of life. Amen. He understand, you understand what I'm saying. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you a drink if you're thirsty. Oh, no, 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 no. He said, I am the drink. That's what makes the difference. And it is that we begin to feast off of Christ and who he is. You say, preacher, I don't have the faith to do that. I don't either. Nobody has the faith to do that. Faith like that does not originate from this earth. You can't buy it. You can't create it. You can't drum it up. There's nothing you can do about it, but you can sure accept it because it'll come down from God. Faith is the gift of God. It's one of those many things that we call the graces of God. The graces of God, graces that minister to you, that living water. Are you thirsty today? I mean, are you really thirsty today? Have you dried up in the desert of your life? Is your desert really dry? Have you been searching for water and you can't find it and your tongue is parched and your soul is drying up? If you're really thirsty, I suggest today, I invite you to the Lord Jesus Christ for he will give peace and life to your soul. Are you hungry today? Have you been eating at Satan's trough? Have you tried 
tried everything in this world? Have you read all the philosophies, been to all the religions, tried every church, every denomination, and you're still empty? You're still hungry. You still haven't been satisfied. I'm going to tell you there's just one that satisfies. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does satisfy the soul. When that salvation becomes real, it's going to change you. And it's going to make you different in this life. And other people are going to know that. When they get around you, they're going to discover something about you that's in them. And they're going to marvel too because they marvel at the wondrous hand of God. My friend, I'd say this. I've never, never met another person just like me. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm sure a lot of you say the same thing, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I've met a whole lot of people that are saved by the same Savior that I've been saved by. Amen. Even though they retain their individuality, even though they retain their identity, even though I marvel at the marvelous, I mean, it's a marvelous thing at all that God can do and how he's done it with so many different people. It is the same Holy Ghost indwelling you that is indwelling me and the same Savior is my bread of life that is your bread of life. In other words, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to brag on the Son of God. I want to exalt his holy name. I want to get alone when nobody's around. I want to make sure I'm there when there's not a soul that can hear me. And I want to tell him how I love him. I want him to understand that my life is in his hands. I tell him every day that I live, my life is in your hands. I got that a few years ago lying flat on my back. Never be the same again. Sometimes you take your life for granted. I don't take mine for granted. Every day I live is a gift from God. And I tell him, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my life. I find myself going through the day now in different ways that I never had before, thanking him for this and thanking him for that and acknowledging him in every part of my life. I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'll walk out of a hospital, walking down the aisle. People think I'm crazy if they're walking around me. That's okay. That doesn't bother me a bit. They'll hear me saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, because you're a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God. Amen. Do you want me to tell you about the God I serve today? He's a good God. He's been good to me. He's been better to me than I could ever deserve. I couldn't earn that love and mercy and grace. He's a good God. Won't you try my God? Your God failed you? Has your God let you down? Has your God, uh, has your God abandoned you? Let me tell you about the one that will never leave you nor forsake you. He's a good God. And when Satan looked at him and realized how far he'd fallen, Satan had fallen from an exalted position. Boy, what a horrible thing it must have been. For 33 and a half years, Satan, even at Christ's birth, he tried to destroy him, but he couldn't do it. The Holy Ghost was there to protect him, sent him down into Egypt and brought him back when Herod was dead. Satan was in all of that. Satan was there to destroy him. There on the cross, the bulls of Bashan attacked him and assaulted him. He couldn't do the job. He watched helplessly as the Lord Jesus Christ walked right down in the middle of his terrain, walked right face to face against him and stripped him of his power and went to the cross and was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. It was a horrible, horrible death blow for Satan. Now folks stand around and men are ignorant, dumb like a dumb animal, don't even understand the battle it rages. But make no mistake about it today, folks. The spirit world is here right now and they understand the battle it rages. They know that your soul lies in the balance. They know that your eternity is in view right now and the forces arrayed against you are unbelievable. It is a spiritual force that you can't meet in the flesh. It is an ancient force that our wisdom can't deal with. It is a malevolent sport, a, a force that wants to strip you of everything in your life and leave you a casualty on the side of the road. But in the name of Jesus, you can come against them. In the name of Jesus, you can come with power and authority. And in the name of Jesus, you can plead the blood covenant and the blood, co a blood atonement of Calvary and stop them dead in their tracks. As a matter of fact, you can send them running. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we're in a spiritual battle? I really believe it. 
And so this is why when the Bible says in the Gospel of John, I am that I am, I say that's the same I am with the book of Exodus. That's the great I am that spoke to Moses. I am that I am. Do you know what that means? He means by that I exist because I exist. I am from everlasting to everlasting. I need nothing. There is no God beside of me. But because of his nature and who he is, he'll take a piece of dirt, he'll make a body out of it, and he'll breathe into that dirt the breath of life. And then that which was nothing but dirt can look up into the eyes of God. I was dirt, but now I can look into his eyes. You talk about blessed. God's been good to me. I can shout this morning and say to you, this old boy that came from the pit one day will look upon the face of Almighty God. You can't do anything about that. That's a marvelous thing. And the invitation is to you. To any of you, anybody here this morning who wants to come, these things are written that you might believe. Now, now notice carefully, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels, but one gospel in particular, its motive is made clear from the very start, so you might believe. The little old Greek word pistuo is the word translated believe. Somebody said, what does that word mean, preacher? Well, you can run to a Greek lexicon. And you can get Greek definitions for it. You can do Greek word studies and all of that. These things are all fine in their place. But let me tell you simply what it means. It means to embrace with everything that you have, not intellectually, but from the heart. From the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Reach up and take hold of him and he becomes your savior. Now here's the lie of Satan. Here it is. This is a big one. But boy, does he use it to affect every day. Satan said, now, look, you've tried this before. You've joined every church in town. You've prayed the sinner's prayer a dozen times. And look at your life. It's nothing but a waste. You're nothing but a failure. You're a loser. You'll never make it. Why bother God? This is just so much more emotionalism. Leave it alone. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Have you borne his yoke? Have you carried his weight? Have you noticed how it gets lighter at times? Have you noticed how that when he's carrying it with you? As Charles Spurgeon said 150 years ago, that great English preacher, I love the way he said it. He said, when you come down to it and you're carrying a load, you'll always find that he's carrying the heavy end of it. You'll always find that he's carrying the hardest part of it. You'll always find that he's always there and that he'll never fail you and he'll never leave you. Oh, if I could just get people to understand this simple truth, it's not up to you to succeed. It's not up to you to be good enough to be saved or even be good after you're saved. That's not the issue. You need a savior and the Lord Jesus Christ is the savior and let him, when he saves you, save you. Your life is not my life. Your, pa your history and your past is not my past. Every one of us are individuals. When he begins to save a soul, he saves that soul, that life, that testimony. Amen. Some of you, the hole he got you out of might not have been as deep as the one he got me from. Some of you, when he got you, he might not have had to clean as much filth off of you as he did me. But I'll tell you right now, it takes the same blood and the same covenant and the same Savior. John, what do you want us to know, son? Tell us what the message is. What your message to mankind. All right. Glad you asked, John says. Here's what he ends his book with. John chapter number 20 and verse number 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Amen. 21 verse 25 of John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. The which if they should be written every one. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Thank you John. Yeah. John finishes his book by saying amen. Amen is not, an, is not a New Testament term. Amen is not an English term. Amen is a Hebrew word. 
If you ever get around a Jewish synagogue, you'll hear amen all the time. What does it mean, pre preacher? Here's the simple meaning of the word amen. True and faithful, so it is. Amen. So the apostle John put his mark on his book and said, amen. Now I'm going to finish the book. Here's the last book, chapter in the book. I like to call the books of the Bible chapters <laughs> because there's only one book. John, I mean, Revelation written by John, chapter 22, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take, not drink, take the water of life freely. Now look how the Old Testament ends. Look at Malachi, last book in Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, book of Malachi. Zechariah Malachi, chapter number four. Here's how the Old Testament ends. Malachi chapter four, verse six. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The last word in the Old Testament is curse. The first word in the New Testament, Matthew chapter number 24, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament ends with a curse. The New Testament starts with a book about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's blessing to you. He was cursed, can never be cursed again. Would you accept him? How many in this house today understand what I'm talking about when I say you must be born again? Thank God. I believe you. I believe you. How many in this house, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many in here? How many in this house today you say, I can't raise my hand, preacher, because I don't know? I don't know. Well, you can know. Let me say this first of all. You're in the midst of friends. We love you. You're in the midst of friends. We don't want your money. We're not going to use you to advance ourselves. We're not interested in connections through you. One simple thing, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you are in the midst of friends. We will do everything we can in our power by the grace of God. If it's not just today, it'll be tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, until the Lord comes back, we'll do what we can to gently point you to the Savior of our soul. Every one of us in this house, if you're a born again believer in this house, how many of you agree with me? You are in this house this morning because of what he did for you. Amen. So, have you noticed how that you haven't heard any preaching about great men, great movements, great this, great that? The only thing you're going to hear in here is a great God. <laughs> great God. <laughs> Our Lord God Almighty. Father, in thy name we pray. Thank you, Lord, for being good to me. You've been so good to me. In thy precious name we pray. Amen. Let's have these little ones come up here, and y'all come on up and play the instrument. But we got a little one that's going to quote Scripture, right? This will be a good time. These little ones are learning the Word of God. Amen. This, to me, this is the most wonderful.